And in accordance with Standing Order 43, the time for member statements has concluded. We'll move to questions without notice. Are there any questions without notice? Oh, I call the Prime Minister first on Yes, uh, Madam Speaker, if I may. The Minister for Foreign Affairs is in Paris to attend a meeting of the small group of the Global Coalition to Combat Daesh and will be absent from question time for the remainder of the week. The Deputy Prime Minister will answer questions on her behalf. I also inform the House that the Minister for Trade and Investment will be absent from question time while he recovers from a medical procedure. The Deputy Prime Minister will also answer questions on his behalf. And we move to questions without notice, and I call the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer to the unprecedented Cabinet leak of national security. Has the Prime Minister asked the Federal Police to investigate the source of this Cabinet leak? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, I know that uh, oppositions, quite rightly, are concerned with uh, these sorts of issues. But, Madam Speaker, the important thing is that the people Remember of Australia Jagger Jagger. know that they have a government which takes their national security seriously. The important thing is that the people of Australia know on my left. that this is a government which has a clear and definite plan to protect them Particularly from people the for who would do them harm. Now, Madam Speaker, uh, last week the government uh, announced a clear plan. We will strip citizenship from terrorists who are dual nationals. The member for Jagger Jagger is war. That. We will strip citizenship uh, from terrorists who are dual nationals. We will be introducing legislation shortly to bring this about. And it's interesting that the shadow attorney general comes to the dispatch box. Where does Labor stand? Where does Labor stand? The member for Isaacs on a point of order. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To be relevant, the Prime Minister should Ladies refer to whether or not the leak, his seat. the leak. Well, remember his seat, and I would remind the member for Isaacs that repeating the question is not a proper point of order, which he ought to know. The Prime Minister has the call. So, Madam Speaker, uh, the government has a very clear position. We will strip citizenship from terrorists who are dual nationals. We will strip citizenship from terrorists who are dual nationals. Uh, beyond that, yes, Madam you. Speaker, we uh, have released a public uh, consultation paper, a discussion paper, which I commend to the Leader of the Opposition and all members of this House uh, on this broad subject. But, Madam Speaker, shortly legislation will come before this Parliament to strip citizenship from terrorists who are dual nationals. And, Madam Speaker, I think the people of Australia deserve to know where the Labor Party stands on this issue. The position of the government is clear. We will strip citizenship from terrorists who are dual nationals. And, Madam Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition should do the people a favour and tell us exactly where he stands on this. I call the honourable member for Herbert. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime I Minister inform the House? I cannot hear the member for Herbert. He Shame. will begin again, and there will be silence. Shame. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister inform the House how many small businesses in my electorate of Herbert will benefit from this budget, from our budget, small business tax cuts? How does helping small businesses support jobs and growth in my city of Townsville? I call the honourable the prime minister. Well, Madam Speaker, I uh, do thank the member for Herbert for his question. It was good to be with him in Townsville in the week after the budget, and indeed to visit Juliet's Cafe, one of the great small businesses in Townsville, which always makes uh, runners and cyclists very welcome indeed. Now, Madam Speaker, Juliet's Cafe is one of almost 10,000 small businesses in Herbert that will benefit from this year's budget. And, Madam Speaker, there are small businesses all around the country who will benefit from this year's budget. Uh, today I was at the small business kiosk at Harvey Normans in Fishwick uh, with the member for Eden Monero and with Senator Zazelja. Again, Madam Speaker, one of the 22,000 small businesses in the ACT and 11,000 small businesses in Eden Monero that will benefit from this year's Budget. Madam Speaker, this budget is the best budget ever.
for the small businesses of Australia. The five and a half billion dollars of small business the member tax for Bendigo. cuts, the biggest tax cuts ever for small business in this year's budget. There's a 1.5 per cent cut in the company tax rate for incorporated small business. There's a 5 per cent tax discount for unincorporated small businesses. And best of all, Madam Speaker, there is the instant asset write-off of $20,000 again and again and again for all small businesses. Now, Madam Speaker, these are important because small business is the engine room of the economy. It's the locomotive of jobs growth. Small business people mortgage their homes, Madam Speaker, to invest, to employ and to serve their communities. And, Madam Speaker, when small business does well, every single business does well. Now, Madam Speaker, 96 per cent of all Australian businesses are small businesses. They employ some four and a half million people. Uh, they create almost 50 per cent of all new jobs. And as the Business Council of Australia said of our small business budget package, it is an absolute shot in the arm for small business. And, Madam Speaker, if it's a shot in the arm for small business, it's a shot in the arm for big business too, because small business buys from big business. Now, Madam Speaker, with the economy in transition, it is important that these budget measures to help small business get through the parliament as quickly as possible. Some small businesses are reluctant to invest until the measures pass uh, the parliament. I say to the Leader of the Opposition, let's not let politics get in the way of economics. Let's not let uh, self-interest get in the way of national interest. Let's pass this bill straight away. I call the honourable member for Sydney. <laughs> Thank you. Fair enough. Uh, the member for Sydney is waiting for her own side to be quiet to ask her question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. I refer once again to the Cabinet leak on national security. Can the Prime Minister confirm the 10-day rule, the Cabinet rule, was not followed? And does the Prime Minister agree with his Communications Minister that the Cabinet is a shambles? Yes. I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, again, I make the point that the government has an absolutely clear position when it comes to terrorists with dual citizenship. We have an absolutely clear position when it comes to terrorists with dual citizenship. They will lose their Australian citizenship. Very, very clear position from the government. Terrorists with dual citizenship will be stripped of their Australian nationality. That's our position, Madam Speaker. And again, I say to the Leader of the Opposition, what is his position? Uh, does he want to allow terrorists with dual nationality to keep their Australian citizenship? That's the question. That's the question. Member, Madam, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker uh, this is a government which has a very strong record when it comes to national security. Uh, we've spent something like $1.3 billion to improve uh, the performance of our national security Prime Minister, agencies. Would you receive the management of opposition business on a point of order. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Could the Prime Minister table the legislation he's referring to? Because yes, no one's seen it. Order, the member. And you know perfectly well there's no point of order, and you can consider yourself warned. The Prime Minister has the call. Like it's called the well, right Madam, Speaker, Madam Speaker, plainly, plainly, members opposite. Uh, the uh, member for Carrio. Shout and listen. So I simply make the point, Madam Speaker, that this is a government which has invested an additional $1.3 billion in strengthening our police and national security agencies. This is a government which has successfully put through the parliament four tranches uh, of improved counter terrorist legislation. Uh, we've just appointed a counter terrorism coordinator. And, Madam Speaker, within uh, a fortnight we will have introduced into the parliament legislation to strip terrorists who are dual nationals of their Australian citizenship. And, Madam Speaker, I expect members opposite to give us support on this important measure. I call the honourable member for Murray. I thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. 
Will the Deputy Prime Minister update the House on new infrastructure projects being funded by the government, particularly in this year's budget? I call the Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development, well, and I will remind much, uh... the member for Green that he's warned. Well, you are now. <laughs> I th thank, the Deputy I thank Prime Minister the, has the call. The, the Speaker for, uh, for calling me and for his uh, good advice to the honourable member opposite. But uh, I'm, all, I'm delighted to report to the Parliament on the outstanding commitments of this government towards infrastructure in the last budget. Here, here. Our commitments are at least $17 billion higher than anything ever promised by Labor—$17 billion more than Labor had promised. And yet we still have Labor members opposite, including the Leader of the Opposition, making these spurious claims about funding being cut in the last budget, when it actually clearly went up. Clearly went up. The budget papers make it absolutely clear that from 2014 to 2016 the expenditure on roads will double. The expenditure on rail will almost double. Major commitments to building the infrastructure that this nation, uh, uh, nation needs. And the Honourable Member for Grainder and others often talk about this government not spending money on rail. Well, we're doubling the amount of money uh, uh, being spent on rail, and in addition to that, there's close to $2 billion to be provided now through the Asset Recycling Fund for rail projects in, in New South Wales and ACT. And of course, if other states want to join the asset recycling plan, plan there will be opportunities for them as well. But when it comes to, to, to projects for, for, for roads, uh, around 95 new projects have been committed to by this government, which were never ever mentioned by Labor. Never ever mentioned by Labor. And of course, that includes a $6 million for the Midland Highway in the Honourable Members electorate. And it includes money for the Great Ocean Road, also in Victoria. $2.9 billion as well for the Western Sydney Roads package. And over a billion dollars for Toowoomba's second range cross, which I, I, I'm anxious to see start as quickly as possible. There's money for the North South Corridor project in Adelaide. Labor has Remember never supported Greenler. the Toowoomba Range project. I remind never him he's supported it. And, he can leave and of or course, we're funding the Outback yours. Way, West Connects, and a whole host of projects that are going to make a real difference to Australia's infrastructure bank and ensure that Australian motorists and and, and rail travellers have access to the kind of technology, access to the kind of infrastructure that is necessary in this century. This is the government for building. It's about building roads, building rails, getting the job done, making a difference for Australians. I call the honourable member for Jagger Jagger. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Social Services. The member has the call. Okay. Silence on the my clock right. Hasn't changed either. You're right, Jenny. That's your time. It's your time. That was your time's up, Warren. Warren. Um, there will be silence on my right, and the uh, member for Jagger Jagger has the call, and the clock will begin again. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Social Services. Last week, the Minister for Social Services told retirees they must run down their superannuation savings to maintain their incomes. But today's financial review reports the Minister has no intention of forcing Australians to withdraw more from their superannuation nest eggs. When will the Minister stop the chaos and confusion and give retirees the certainty they deserve? I call the Honourable the Minister for Social Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'll, I'll try and make this simple. This is how it works. There are tax concessions given by the government, rightly, started under those opposite, so people can save for their retirement. They earn that money. They don't pay as much tax on that money, so they can put it in superannuation, so they can draw down on it in their retirement. And the reason those tax concessions are important is so that people don't have to draw down on a pension, Madam Speaker. That's a fairly straightforward proposition, which those on this side of the House understand. And what we've said, Madam Speaker, in this budget is that we want to ensure that those on modest and low level of assets 
are able to get a pension increase. 170,000 people will get a pension increase on average of $30 a fortnight as a result of the changes to pensions we've introduced in, as part of this budget. Now, as a result also of the changes, we are going back to the $3 taper rate, which existed under those opposite, which was started by Paul Keating, ran all the way through the Howard government until 2007. And we're going to restore those taper rates as a result of the budget because when the taper rates were changed back in 2007, Madam Speaker, we had around $40 billion in the bank and $20 billion surplus. Now, where did that go? We might ask the member for Lilly where that went because he spent it all, Madam Speaker. He spent it all, and as a result, we are making this change, Madam Speaker, to what we're doing with pensions in the budget. Now, it's a simple proposition. If you're not receiving a part pension, then you can draw down on the superannuation savings that if you have put there for you to draw down in your retirement. That's what you can do. That's what you can do. All we're doing, Madam Speaker, is ensuring that we have a pension that is there to help those most in need. We don't create the pension as some sort of superannuation incentive. That's what the tax concessions are for. But I do note, Madam Speaker, that the member for McMahon has equated the tax concessions for compulsory superannuation contributions as being equivalent to a pension or a welfare payment. That is amazing, Madam Speaker, that those opposite actually equate people's own money people's own money and the tax concessions that are provided to help people save for their retirement so they don't have to draw down on the pension, they equate that to a welfare payment. There would have been antique clocks flashing all over Wallara, Madam Speaker, when the former Treasurer and former Prime Minister Paul Keating found out that his parent heir apparent over there, the member for McMahon, good old PJ over there, PJ Light, thought that the tax concessions that he put in place to ensure that people could save for their retirement was some form of welfare payment. He'd be ashamed of you. The, uh, have you completed your answer? <coughs> oh, well, you're seeking leave. You're not a port of order. You're seeking leave. Yes. To what? I seek leave to table the two documents that show that this minister is has granted, two leave completely is not contradictory. Seat. I call the member for Indi. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Industry. Minister, the government recently announced its intention to change food labelling laws. On Friday in Wodonga, there was a gathering of over 150 businesses at the Australian Manufacturing and Farming Forum, and they raised labelling as a key concern for the future of food manufacturing. Can the minister please update the House on country of origin labelling reform and describe how proposed changes will maintain INDI and Australia's competitive advantage? I call the Honourable the Minister for Industry. And science. I thank the, uh, I thank the member for INDI. I don't know what you're laughing about. I mean, no, I don't think that's right either. In fact, the, 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 uh, the science fraternity are wondering what your side's doing on science. Madam Speaker, can I thank the member for Indi for a question and agree wholeheartedly that the rural sector of Australia are waiting for this government to, to actually put labelling laws in place that work. This is not a quick fix solution. It's a solution which uh, we are all going to have to make sure we get right, and that's part of the process. And I understand a member of uh, the member for Indi's staff attended a food labelling workshop in Albury, and in fact, across April and May, there have been 16 such workshops around Australia as we consult with industry groups and businesses and primary producers about making sure we get the legislation right. It is a process that has to be meticulous. And it's a process, I have to say, which is receiving widespread support from right across the food uh, production and processing level. Um, Madam Speaker, we do need a set of labelling that consumers understand. We do need a set of labelling that the primary producer's well-earned reputation for clean, green Australian food is clearly defined, and we are working towards that. Now, the government is about to begin a significant market research and consumer testing process this month, and it, will con and it has contracted a company to conduct a national representative consumer testing. There is a high level of uh, public interest in this issue, as the member for Indi points out, 
And as a result of that, we are going to release a community survey so that any member of the public, any member of the public, can uh, provide their feedback. In fact, I'm going to ask every member of this House, in fact both Houses, to share with the uh, constituents of their electorate or their state, in the case of a senator, this survey to ensure we get as broad as possible input into this so that the Minister for Agriculture, um, the Assistant Minister for Health, the Minister for Trade and I can sit down and make sure we get this right because, in the end, the most important thing about food labelling is that consumers know the country of origin that the food they're consuming, they're consuming is coming from. Now, I am also working with my state and territory colleagues, and we need the state governments to all assist us in this process. But in the end, for primary producers in Australia, this will deliver a food labelling scheme which will identify Australian food clearly on the container. I call the uh, honourable member for <laughs> Barker. Madam Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Minister inform the House on how the government is promoting business startups? How will the budget encourage small businesses to grow and create jobs? I call the Honourable the Treasurer. Well, thank you for that spontaneous question. And uh, I, the member for Barker grew up in a small business family. Grew up in a small business family. Uh, he. Uh, he represents more than 15,200 small businesses in his electorate. Uh, his mum owned a women's clothing store for 45 years in Mount Gambia, and uh, his father owned a farm. And he himself and his family worked in their own small business. And that's the story of the coalition. We are made up of people that have come from small business families, have worked in small businesses, have had a go to try and employ others and build prosperity and certainly contribute to innovation. And this budget was about helping small business to have a go. The uh, Prime Minister and myself and the member for Eden Monero and Senator Zelja went out to uh, Harvey Norman at Fish Week today. And uh, Harvey Norman, despite uh, it being a big listed company, actually has a lot of franchisees running different departments. They are small business people in many ways, and they came up to us saying that they're starting to see a lot of people come through the doors who want to buy that extra bit of equipment, that extra computer, that elect extra electronic product that is going to help to grow their business. And they're seeing a great deal of consumer confidence start to come through, which means if you lift the tide with more prosperous small business, it flows right through the Australian economy. And that's exactly what our $5.5 billion jobs and small business program was focused on, about lifting confidence, about lifting opportunity. And the member for Barker sent me a copy of a letter he received from a uh, Mena D'Agostino uh, from Joe D'Agostino Accounting uh, in Mount Gambia, and he says, uh, "Dear Tony, it's not Tony Trades, it's Tony Barker, <laughs> Tony Passive and Barker, and uh, the real another Tony. They're all Tony's Trades, and all Tony's Trades." I thought I'd take this opportunity to thank you and the government for the small business package announced on budget night. We have received an unprecedented level of inquiry regarding that package, in particular requests for information regarding eligibility and operation of the package. This package has had the effect of increasing business confidence amongst our mostly small business client base. Given this level of inquiry, we feel certain that the instant asset write-off in particular will strengthen the local economy and boost jobs. How good is that? Strengthen the local economy and boost jobs. Okay, so here's a challenge to the Labor Party. This legislation is going to go through the House of Representatives this week. Absolutely right. Then it goes to the Senate, which has only two weeks to sit. And I lay down the challenge to the Labor Party. Help us to get that legislation through the Senate as quickly as possible. I call the Honourable Lee, Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister agree with his Treasury Secretary, who said today there is unequivocally a housing bubble in Sydney and in higher priced areas of Melbourne? 
I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, as, a, I, as, as someone who, uh, along with the bank, owns a house in Sydney, I do hope that our housing prices are increasing. Uh, I do want housing to be affordable, but nevertheless, I also want house prices uh, to be modestly increasing. Now, Madam be Speaker, silence on my left. Now, Madam Speaker, the member for Rankin. Madam Speaker, the member for Hotham is warned. Prime Minister has the call. Now, ma ma Madam Speaker, yeah. um, the important thing is to ensure that our economy is as strong as possible so that people have as much resources at their disposal as possible, have jobs so that they can go out there and buy the things they need, including the housing that they need. That's the important thing, and that's what this government is doing. Uh, this government is trying to make uh, housing more available. We are trying to make housing more affordable, and the best way to make housing more affordable is the to keep interest rates low and stable, and that's exactly what's happening, Indigo. and to try to ensure that the economy is strong, and that's what we're doing with the instant asset write-off and the other measures associated with this budget. So, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker I welcome uh, the statements of the Treasury Secretary, and I say if the Leader of the Opposition is concerned uh, that things uh, are happening that shouldn't be happening. The best thing he can do is work with us to get the small business budget yeah, boost yeah. through the parliament yeah. as quickly as possible. That's the best thing that you can do because that will put more money in people's pockets. That will mean more jobs that people can have and hold down, better jobs that people can have and hold down if the Leader of the Opposition wants to boost the economy, if he wants to make every Australian better off. Let the budget, the small business budget boost, come through the parliament as quickly as possible, and I invite him to join with the government and do precisely that. I call the honourable member for Tangney. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Social Services. Will the minister update the House about what steps the government is taking to help families through? more affordable access to childcare without costing taxpayers more. I call the honourable the Minister for Social Services. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for Tagney for question on the budget. I'm pleased that members on this side of the House are still interested in asking questions about the budget. Those opposite have clearly put up the white flag on the budget, Madam Speaker. They've put their push modelling in the bin and they've decided to spray questions around from one topic to the other and they've lost interest in this year's budget, but we haven't, Madam Speaker, because we know that this budget is going to deliver choice for families. It's going to deliver jobs for families and the choice to be in work and stay in work. And we know that, Madam Speaker, that if you are concerned about the taxpayer, if you have an interest in the taxpayer, you will always put forward measures that you know how to pay for. You will always know how to pay for the promises that you make, because if you don't, you're like the Leader of the Opposition. You're just a budget smuggler, Madam Speaker. You're someone, you're someone who thinks you can just announce things without having to pay for them. And you're like the, the Shadow Minister for Social Services, Madam Speaker. <laughs> you're like the Shadow Minister for Social Services when asked how you're going to pay for this increase in support for childcare. Well, you've got to pay for it somehow, she says. Somehow. You've got to go to the somehow bucket. And the member for has got a bucket over there. It just says somehow. And you pull all the costings and the funding for your policies out of that. But, Madam Speaker, the way we're doing it, the way we're going to pay for jobs for families for that package which is providing support for childcare is we're using the same measures that, frankly, those opposite did when they were in government, Madam Speaker. We're making changes to freeze payments for family tax benefits and other measures, which is exactly what those opposite did when they were in government. Seven million billion dollars worth of savings, Madam Speaker, for freezing indexation of family tax benefits, some six billion dollars that was saved for scrapping the linking of pension indexation with family tax benefit indexation and abolishing <coughs> increases to family tax benefits, some $15 billion, Madam Speaker. But in addition to that, 
What they also did, Madam Speaker, is they abolished the grandfathering arrangements for parenting payments. And it's interesting when you look at the Leader of the Opposition's record on this, because when the Howard government introduced this with grandfathering, this is what he said. He said Labor described the welfare change as extreme, accusing the government of lifting money out of the pockets of sole parents, and he said there was no evidence that dumping people into the dole would help them get a job. But when he was abolishing the grandfathering arrangements, which, which led to these same outcomes, Madam Speaker, this is what he said. He says the changes to parenting, parent, parenting payment will encourage parents with school-aged children to re-enter the workforce sooner and to enter, ensure a fair and consistent set of parenting payment eligibility rules. What we know about this Leader of the Opposition, Madam Speaker, is what he supports today he opposes tomorrow, and what he opposes today he supports Member tomorrow. He knows that that if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there, and we know that this Leader of the Opposition is on a road to nowhere. I call the Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Madam Speaker. <coughs> My question is to the Prime Minister. Since Budget Night, Labor has supported the government's small business measures. In fact, a number of these measures were formerly Labor measures. So why are the Prime Minister and his ministers undermining small business confidence by claiming there is any doubt that this legislation will pass the Houses of Parliament. There will be silence on both sides of the House, including the Treasurer. The Prime Minister has the call. You are not going to delay with an inquiry the, bill? The Treasurer, the Prime Minister has the call. Well, ma Madam Speaker, if, if the Leader of the Opposition is saying uh, that the Labor Party in the Senate will ensure that this legislation goes through the Parliament, goes through the Parliament uh, within a fortnight, without any inquiries. It simply goes through the Senate. Well, I am delighted. Yeah, yeah, I am delighted. Yeah, yeah, without and any I say, inquiries, and I no say, delays. This is a rare piece of bipartisanship in the Parliament, and I thank uh, the Leader of the Opposition for extending the hand of magnanimity uh, on this subject. But, Madam Speaker, after all the damage that Labor did to small business, over six years, yeah. it's high time. It's high time uh, that uh, that they made it up to small business with this measure. But, Madam Speaker, I am I am delighted. I do look forward to this measure going through the parliament because I want to see the small businesses of Australia out there investing, employing, and serving their communities. That's what I want to do. I'm proud of the treasurer. Uh, and the Minister for Small Business. I'm proud of the government more generally for coming up with this measure, and I am pleased that Labor now says that they will give an absolute ironclad guarantee that it will pass through the parliament in the next fortnight. I call the honourable member for Macquarie. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. I remind the Minister that the government, through Operation Sovereign Borders, has stopped the boats ended the deaths at sea and regained control of Australia's borders. Will the minister inform the House of the effect of the government's successful border protection policies on this year's budget? I call the honourable the Minister for Immigration and Border Protection. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I thank the uh, member for Macquarie. And I acknowledge uh, her hard work as the chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Migration. She's a great local member. She has a very strong voice for Macquarie in this place on matters uh, relating to migration and national security. Madam Speaker, in this year's budget, uh, in this portfolio, we were able to give back $500 million, $500 million to the budget so that we can pay for the measures associated with uh, childcare uh, increases uh, in the support for parents with kids, uh, for the small business measures, uh, for tightening uh, biometric security at our borders. A number of other budget measures, uh, Madam Speaker, which of course was not possible when Labor was in power because in this portfolio they had an $11 billion blowout because 52,000 people came on 800 boats. Now, not only is it a budget savings, but more importantly, Madam Speaker, the 1,200 people who drowned at sea under Labor, that death and carnage has now stopped under this government because we have been able, Madam Speaker, we have been able to stop the boats. We have been able to turn back boats where it's safe to do so. And at the ALP conference in a couple of weeks, the Leader of the Opposition, if he's worth anything, will get up and stare down Tendi Plibersek on the left on this the very important issue. Because if they don't turn back boats where it's safe to do so, 
the boats will recommence and the debts at sea will recommence. Now, the Madam Speaker, is warned. when you look at the incompetence that prevailed during Labor's time uh, in government, it wasn't just in relation to economic management. The member for Lilly is uh, smiling up there. He's reading the chapter. On uh, what, 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 what chapter are you up to, Swanee? What chapter? Is this four against Bill Shorten, four against Julia, four against Kevin? I mean, where are you up to in the book? The Minister is doing his seat. The member for Parramatta at a point of order. Point of order, Madam Speaker. The member should refer to members by their correct title. The Minister has the call and will refer to members by their correct title. I take it as a heavy blow. Madam Speaker, the, the, point, the point of all of this is that if you look at the incompetence that prevailed when Labor was last in government, it still sits on this front bench. It still sits on that front the bench. Member for Wakefield. It's been 300 days since we've had a successful people smuggling venture come to this country. 300 days under Operation Sovereign Borders. Now, the member for Watson, he could only manage six days. He, uh, he tied, of course, with the member for Gorton, uh, Mr O'Connor. He had uh, six days as minister, a long period of six days between boat arrivals, a massive achievement, trumped, of course. Uh, by the member for McMahon, who was clearly an overachiever in the Labor government, it was 23 days. 23 days. So while he was writing his book about the success of Fuel Watch and Grocery Watch, he managed to get through 23 days with no boat arrivals. Madam Speaker, the point of all of this is that Labor ripped apart the economy when they were in government. They destroyed border security. If they're re-elected at the next election, they'll do it all again. I call the honourable member for McMahon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. I refer to last week's disastrous capital expenditure results for Australian businesses, down 11 per cent since the election. When will the Treasurer accept that his words and his actions have done real and lasting damage to confidence and investment in Australia? I call the uh, Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, order. understanding order 100, there's no attempt in that question <coughs> at all to ask a question. It's simply an assertion. It's quite impossible for the Treasurer to answer that question. And I would ask the Shadow Treasurer to perhaps take the time to redraft it into a question rather than simply making assertions. On the point of order. Well, on the point of order, Madam Speaker, questions can go to the responsibility of the minister. The minister is responsible for confidence and investment in the Australian economy as the treasurer of the nation. The, uh, the question is bordering on being almost unintelligible. However, I'm going to let the question stand, and the treasurer has the call. I'm, uh, I'm happy to help the member from Martin to try and understand what he just said. And uh, I make the point that uh, we, since we've been in government, what we've seen is, uh, despite the iron ore price falling from $120 to around uh, $54 a tonne, uh, despite the headwinds out of the global economy, we have seen a government with a plan focus on implementing a plan that goes like this. Uh, the plan ensures that we start to live within our means. As a nation, we start to reduce our expenditure. As a government, we stop the waste. As a government, we get rid of the taxes that are going to be a handbrake on the Australian economy, like the, the carbon tax, Bendigo. like the mining tax, which Labor wants to reintroduce. And at the same time, and at the same time, we show respect for taxpayers, because every dollar the government spends is a dollar that comes out of the pocket of hard-working Australians. So we treat taxpayers' dollars with respect. The member for Therefore, when we, when we introduce a budget, as we did last year and as we did this year, we lay down a plan that shows a credible path back to surplus. A credible path back to surplus. The and member in for doing so, is we had to make some difficult decisions. There's no doubt about that. But ultimately, you would think that uh, the people responsible for creating the mess would help us to try and fix it. And it was the Labor Party. I mean, they left us with government expenditure running uh, at $133 million a day, more than what we were collecting in revenue. So every day, what we inherited was every day we had to borrow $133 million just to pay our bills as a government. 
Now, we've got it down to $96 million a day, but that's still way too much. So we rely on the, on the goodwill of the parliament to support our measures, which are aimed, on the one hand, at strengthening the Australian economy and, on the other hand, also strengthening the government's own balance sheet so that we can prepare Australia for the future. Now, the challenge for Labor is that they are opposing or blocking $58.6 billion of different initiatives, including $6.5 billion of savings they themselves announced but now oppose. Can you believe that? They actually said when they were last in government, yes, the budget needs repair, here are measures that need to be implemented, and when they went into opposition they used their numbers in the Senate to block us implementing their own initiatives to fix the budget. But I say to you, Madam Speaker, as I say to all the Australian people, we are determined to get Australia back to the point where it lives within its means. We are determined to create a stronger economy where people can get a job and have ambition for greater prosperity. I call the honourable member for Brisbane. My question is to the Minister for Justice and the Minister assisting the Prime Minister on counter-terrorism. Will the Minister advise the House what steps the government is taking to improve regional coordination and build capacity to challenge violent extremism? I call the Honourable Minister for Justice and Minister assisting the Prime Minister on counter-terrorism. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And can I thank the member for Brisbane for that question? Uh, and she is well aware, as are others in the House, that the threat of terrorism to Australia uh, and to our region has significantly increased. This is not a threat that we face alone. It's shared by our traditional security partners, but it's also shared by those closest to us in the region. We have more than 100 Australians fighting in the conflicts in Iraq and Syria, and they form part of the 20,000 foreign fighters that have been drawn into this conflict. Reports from the Munich Security Conference have said that uh, France has approximately 1,200 nationals fighting, uh, the United Kingdom and Germany approximately 600, uh, Russia well over 1,000. Here in our region, the Indonesians have at least 200 people engaged and the Malaysians up to 60. The threat from, this in, the, the threat from these international conflicts to Australia cannot be overstated. And the government has been on the front foot making sure that we have our security agencies and our intelligence community equipped with the powers and the resources that they need to address it. We have passed legislation to declare particular areas uh, off limits, uh, and those who go to a declared area can face up to 10 years' imprisonment. Uh, we have listed terrorist organisations. Returning fighters linked to terrorist organisations can face up to 25 years' imprisonment. Uh, we have got a new offence of advocating terrorism. You cannot now uh, counsel, promote, encourage or urge the doing of a terrorist act. We have also given our law enforcement agencies stronger tools, control orders, we have lowered the arrest thresholds and we have given greater flexibility to our courts to deal in evidence that has been collected uh, in foreign countries. Every day we know that these death cults tweet over 100,000 pieces of propaganda. Every day, 100,000 pieces of propaganda. And what they are doing is they are grooming Australians online, so literally reaching through the computers to our young people. Uh, in the midst of their families to radicalise and recruit them to extremist ideologies. So we want to work with our partners about what we can do to address this. The Attorney General and I will be co-hosting a conference in Sydney next week. Uh, it will be Australia's regional summit to countering violent extremism. And we've invited ministerial representation from around the region uh, and from our traditional security partners to attend. The summit will also be bringing together civil society, key stakeholders who can work with us uh, from industry and the non-government sector to address this challenge through practical resources and strategies. Um, and they will also um, host sessions on how to, uh, how to uh, stop using the internet to disseminate propaganda. This meeting will be a very important step for us to deal with this collective threat to our regional security. Uh, we cannot afford to wait whilst the death cult uh, whilst the death cult uh, uh, radicalises our young people, um, before we need to address this before they can do us harm, and that's what the regional summit will help us do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I call the honourable member for McMahon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. I refer to the 17 new taxes and charges in his budget. 
Isn't it the case that these tax hikes will put, help push up tax as a percentage of the economy higher each and every year over the next four years and higher than at any point under the previous Labor government? I call the Honourable the Treasurer. Jeez, I wish I inherited a budget that uh, the previous Labor government inherited. Yeah, yeah. Gee, I wish I inherited you know, a $20 billion surplus and $40 billion in the bank yeah. and unemployment with a four in Remember front of it. Remember, Scullin is That's not in his seat. I Remember, the law is but not I in her seat. And but neither of you will speak or you'll leave. I, mean, I didn't inherit that. So we've got to deal with what we, what we inherit and we've got to make sure that we improve the situation. And the fact is that we are endeavouring to improve the situation. But the problem is that, that Labor locked in expenditure growth of 3.6 per cent. 3.6 per cent. So let's go through them. You know, they had a foreign, a foreign aid budget that they never paid for. They had a foreign aid promise that they could never pay for. And now this uh, shadow minister for uh, foreign affairs wants to increase it by $18 billion. Where's the money coming from? Where's the money coming from? And then they had bonus payments for schools, bonus payments for schools, which they promised but never paid for. And I say to the shadow minister for schools, where's that money coming from? And then they had bonus payments for hospitals. In the out years, somewhere out there, they made promises about hospitals and uh, the shadow minister for hospitals running around saying, we'll do that. I ask her, where's the money coming from? And defence, defence. They put off decisions about submarines. They put off decisions about defence expenditure. Tens of billions of dollars of expenditure. The shadow minister for defence out there saying we'll deliver that. I asked that shadow minister, where's the money coming from? And the National Disability Insurance Scheme. The leader of the opposition says we'll deliver that in full. But don't worry, don't worry. We'll find the money for it somewhere. Well, I asked the Leader of the Opposition, where was that money coming from? You see, this is a problem with Labor. They make these big, heroic political promises. They stand at the top of their mouth and say to the Australian people, we will give it to you. But the problem is they haven't got the money. Now, as Margaret Thatcher said, sooner or later the thing about socialists is that they run out of other people's money. The member for Somehow, somewhere. This money tree, which I have not yet found, I have searched high and low, all over Canberra, walked through the parks, gone down to Treasury, searched out for this magical money tree, and I report, I report to you, Madam Speaker, there is no money tree. There is no money tree. There's no gold at the end of the rainbow. I say to the honourable leader of the opposition. Sooner or later, the truth will catch up with him. Sooner or later, he has to explain to the Australian people where the money is coming from. I call, I call the honourable member for Flynn. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education and Training. Will the minister inform the House of the importance of ensuring our students have a solid growth in? have a solid grounding in maths and science. What support is there for the government's approach? I call the Honourable the Minister for Education and Training. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for Flynn for that question. And the member for Flynn, like me, Madam Speaker, and this side of the House, knows that the states are responsible for literacy and numeracy and that our results are declining. He knows that the states are responsible for science and mathematics and that the take-up has been poor and the results are declining. He knows that the states are responsible for teacher quality in Australia, and that is the most important feature identified by the OECD for improvement. Number one, teacher quality in Australia. He knows all these things, as do I on this side of the House, and yet when faced with the opportunity, a proposal to do something about it, the Labor Party and the Labor states squibbed that opportunity on Friday, Madam Speaker, because this government proposed that we should make maths or science compulsory in years 11 and 12 over a long trajectory, and the opposition and the Labor states rejected it, Madam Speaker, because the problem with Labor and the Labor states is they're all talk and no action. 
The problem is they entrench failure, Madam Speaker. They will not depart from the Australian Education Union. This letter of the opposition talks tough in the change room, but when he gets onto the field, Madam Speaker, he's weak. Now, we proposed real action on Friday to do something about maths and science in Australia, supported by the chief scientist and this opposition and the Labor states, they squibbed the opportunity. Not to mention the fact that compulsory maths or science in years 11 or 12 is already in place in China and Taiwan and Singapore and New Zealand and moving in that direction in Great Britain over the next five years. Apparently, the students in those countries are smart enough to do maths or science in years 11 or 12, but this opposition and the Labor states and territories are not prepared to make the tough decisions that will actually improve the outcomes for students. They want to fiddle around on the margins. They want to fiddle around on the margins. But this, op this government gave them the opportunity to actually do something. In the last 10 years, Madam Speaker, our class sizes have shrunk to the smallest they've ever been. <coughs> We've spent 40 per cent more on school education in the last 10 years. So the spending is up. The class sizes are smaller, and yet still our results are declining. It's time for Labor to stop talking tough and not doing. It's time for Labor to get on board with the government and do things about the curriculum, about teacher quality and about the science and math subject in 11 and 12, rather than just squib it. I call the honourable member for McMahon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. The government's own budget papers so the Prime Minister has doubled the budget deficit since his last budget. So why won't the government accept Labor's sensible measure to wind back superannuation concessions for high-income earners, a measure that will improve the budget bottom line by $14 billion over the decade? I call the Honourable the Prime Minister. Well, Madam Speaker, uh, as the budget papers show, uh, we are on a steady path back to surplus. <laughs> Uh, every year, every year, uh, the budget deficit declines by about a half a percentage point of GDP. Uh, Madam Speaker, under this government's budget, uh, uh, peak debt is $110 billion lower, uh, and the forward uh, deficits are $40 billion lower. So, Madam Speaker, this is a government which is taking Australia responsibly back to surplus. That's what we're doing. Uh, that's what we're doing, Madam Speaker. So, so, Madam Speaker, that's what this government is doing, and we're doing it by boosting the small businesses of Australia, because the small businesses of Australia will create jobs, they'll create growth, they'll invest, they'll employ, and they will produce a better society and a better economy. We have faith in the people of Australia to have a go, because we understand, Madam Speaker, that it's only by having a go that you are able to deliver the fair go that every Australian wants, Madam Speaker. That's what's happening under this budget, Madam Speaker. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. Members opposite, uh, they spent like drunken sailors. Uh, they loaded up business, large and small, with endless regulation. Uh, and, Madam Speaker, we are steadily rebuilding our economy, and we know that if we steadily rebuild our economy, we will steadily improve our society. We know that our best days are ahead of us, Madam Speaker. Our best days are ahead of us because this government trusts, this government trusts the small businesses of Australia to know their own best interests. And that's why, unlike members opposite, Unlike members opposite, we don't take people's money away from them to spend it on the things that we think are important. Uh, we say to people, you spend money on the things that you think are important and we will leave more of your money in your pocket through an instant asset write-off. Now, Madam Speaker, I've been asked about superannuation. Well, well, superannuation, the piggy bank that Labor Party ministers are always raiding. The piggy bank that Labor ministers are always raiding. Now, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker we, we, made, we made a commitment before the election that there would be no Might adverse be changes to superannuation under this government, and we are delivering on that commitment. We have no plans to increase superannuation uh, in the years ahead. But, Madam Speaker, members opposite think that your superannuation is their money when they need it. 
You just can't trust your savings with the Labor Party. Yeah, yeah. That's the simple truth, Madam Speaker. I say to the superannuants and the retirees of Australia, you cannot trust your money with the Labor Party. If they see it there and if they've got a problem, they'll take it, and that's what will never happen under this government. I call the honourable member for Leichhardt. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Speaker, and my question is to the outstanding Minister for the Environment. Will the minister update the House on the World Heritage listing? Can I ask that question again, Madam Speaker? There will be silence. Thank you. Thank that you very much indeed. the member for Chifley. Thank you. The member for Leichhardt has the call. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. My a question, straightforward question. My question uh, is to the outstanding Minister for the Environment. Will the minister update the House on the World Heritage listing of the Great Barrier Reef? I call the Honourable the Minister for the Environment. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, I'm delighted to receive the question from the outstanding member for Leichhardt. And he is an outstanding member for Leichhardt. He's not just one of the great champions of the Great Barrier Reef, but he was also the driving force and the architect and the author of the plan to protect dugongs and turtles. So he is a real practical environmentalist. Now he asked about the Great Barrier Reef, and uh, I have to say this: that in 2011, the uh, World Heritage Committee put the Great Barrier Reef, uh, Reef on the watch list, on the watch list for being endangered. In 2012, it was still on the watch list. In 2013, it was still on the watch list, and in 2014, the World Heritage Committee cited improvement, but said there, said there was more to be done. I can report to the House, and I am delighted that on Friday night the World Heritage Centre of UNESCO recommended to the World Heritage Committee that the Great Barrier Reef be removed from the watch list, that it not be declared in danger, and that it specifically praised Australia for its actions in reef management. And what did this decision say? It made no reference to in danger. It made no reference to watch list. It made no reference to probation. It specifically <coughs> praised Australia and the Australian government, as well as the work of successive Queensland governments, in improving the health and the prospects of the Great Barrier Reef. This is a tremendous result for Australia. After five years of uncertainty, we now have certainty. We have a long-term future for the tourism industry. We have an important recognition of the role of Indigenous people and of the investment that communities and governments throughout Australia and up and down the reef are making with regards to water quality, with regards to eradication of the crown of thorns and, in particular, the recognition that the decision we took as a government to end the dumping of dredge disposal in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park was a once-in-a-century decision. Now, against that background, uh, this is not a moment. This is not a moment to be critical of the opposition. I appreciate the fact that they did not run interference on this. I acknowledge the fact that successive Queensland governments played an important role. But when it came down to it, what the World Heritage Centre has recommended to the World Heritage Committee is very simple: no in danger listing, a return to the ordinary reporting cycle of five years, and above all else. Praise for Australia's actions in establishing a 2050 long-term plan, uh, in establishing an additional $200 million between Queensland and the Commonwealth for water quality, and ending the practice of dredge disposal in the marine park forever. Call the honourable member for McMahon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. The government's own budget papers show the Treasurer has doubled the deficit since his last budget. Isn't it the case that spending as a percentage of the economy has gone up under this government, and in the first two budget years of the Abbott government, spending is expected to be near global financial crisis levels? Isn't it the case the Treasurer has lost control of his budget while doubling the budget deficit? I call the Honourable the Treasurer. Oh, I see. I worked it out. I've worked it out. The member for McMahon's trying to set up the member for Lily here. He's trying to set up the member for Lily because 
It was the member for Lilly that delivered a budget that had uh, the biggest percentage of spending in GDP terms in modern times—26 per cent of GDP. That was the member for, the member for Lilly. Now, we want to reduce government expenditure, and I just quote Chris Richardson, who's the director of Deloitte Access Economics. He said this on budget night. He said this on budget night. Spending is really tight as a drum, and that's the hidden magic, if you like, why you're getting better numbers in this budget. That was Chris Richardson in an interview uh, with David Spears on budget night. Spending is really tight as a drum, and we have endeavoured to reduce government expenditure. But the problem is Labor is opposing us at every single point. And despite that, we're still getting expenditure down. Now, the fact is, 86 per cent of all government spending is locked in by legislation. And of that government expenditure, a huge amount of it, such as Medicare and welfare payments, go out the door on the basis of demand. They're uncapped. So what happens is, if you want to change the level of government expenditure, you have to change the legislation. And that's one of the reasons you know. That's, that's very astute. The problem is you don't do. You don't do. You know, but you don't do. And because you know and you don't do, you left the Labor Party left a whole lot of time bombs. A whole lot of time bombs in the budget. The Parliamentary Budget Office on Friday said it was $101 billion yet to be legislated. $101 billion. $101 billion over 10 years. And, and you know what? $101 billion over 10 years, $58.6 billion of commitments by the Leader of the Opposition over four years. Over four years. He spent $220 million a minute in his budget and reply speech. $220 million a minute. He didn't have savings of $220 million a minute. He had expenditure of $220 million a minute. So let me get this right. Labor comes in here and cries crocodile tears about government expenditure, and yet they do everything they possibly can to block us from reducing government expenditure in the Senate. That is hypocrisy. I'm giving them the opportunity to deny the word hypocrisy, but I don't think they will. Because underlying that hypocrisy is the inherent weakness, the, the inherent weakness Valencia of the Leader of the warned. Opposition. He is a weak man. He is like a reed in the wind. He goes whichever way the wind takes him in order to please the left or the right, in order to please the caucus or the union movement. The problem is the Australian people always pay the bill under this bill. I call the honourable member for Ford. Uh, Thank you, Madam Speaker. And my question is to the Minister for Industry and Science. What steps is the Minister taking to address the legacy of the previous government's approach to encouraging home insulation? And how will the government's scheme support businesses that have experienced adverse financial impacts as a result of the early closure of the program in 2010? I call the Honourable the Minister for Industry and Science. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member from Ford for his question. And as is the case right across Australia, I'm sure there are businesses in Ford that have been adversely affected by this failed previous government scheme. Now, Madam Speaker, the Home Insulation Program Industry Payment Scheme has been established in response to the Royal Commission, which was conducted last year, and the findings handed <coughs> down from that report. We've heard today already a number of examples of how extraordinarily incompetent Labor is when it's in government. And I have to draw on another example here today. The bungled home insulation scheme damaged and destroyed homes and businesses right across Australia. Now, of course, whenever there's a Labor bungle and disaster, there's a book. And there's always a book. And so I draw on Alan Beam. The book was actually uh, the preface is written by Greg Combay, no less, who I understand was a minister in the previous government, and and where where he talks on page 143 about the one and a half billion dollars that this government spent on this scheme and the half a billion dollars it then spent trying to fix it, and he talks about the ministerial overreach and carelessness. Now you couldn't describe the previous government better than to say 
the sorts of things it conducted, whether it was in the economy, whether it was in stopping boats, whether it was in the home insulation program, it was full of ministerial incompetence. Now, Madam Speaker, Ms. Mr Beam went on to say in the Sydney Morning Herald that this home insulation program was appalling public policy, appallingly executed, <coughs> and drove advisers working on the program close to despair. Madam Speaker, as always, it's up to this government to fix the previous government's mess, and that's exactly what we're going to do. But well, that's exactly what we're going to do with the industry payment scheme, Madam Speaker. We're going to ask that businesses uh, submit their application to Deloitte's Australia and have it assessed. We're going to have a transparent and equitable and evidence-based process to ensure that payments are made. And, Madam Speaker, we've asked Ian Hanger QC to meet with all the applicants to ensure that this is a fair policy and, as much as we can, we fix the damage that's been done to small business by an incompetent previous Labor government. Now, Madam Speaker, we will do this as quickly as possible because we know out there there are small businesses, as the Minister for Small Business knows, who are still suffering the effects of this previous government's incompetence. And we should never forget it, and we should realise that even the people who are in that government are prepared to say it publicly in writing. I call the honourable member for Hunter. My question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer him to Friday's revelation that the Minister for Agriculture previously sought to influence the conduct of litigation involving his benefactor, Gina Reinhardt. Has the Prime Minister counselled the Minister that uh, any personal intervention in similar court cases in the future the would be inappropriate? The member totally out of order. And Prime Minister, the, the question is out of order, and he knows it's out of order. On what basis, Madam Speaker? Madam Speaker, point of order. Point of order. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Madam Speaker, for a long time in this House, it has been appropriate to ask the Prime Minister about the ministerial code of conduct. You interrupted, you interrupted the mem member for Hunter at the exact point he was asking about the ministerial code of conduct. I hear from the leader of the op uh, leader of government business. Uh, far be it from me to help the man of position business in question time, but the question was about a period of time in which the member for New England wasn't actually a minister of this house, and therefore it's not a matter within the purview of the prime minister's responsibility. Madam Speaker, you can assist the house. I'll be happy to rephrase the question. No. The question is, you are asking a question about a matter for which the Prime Minister has no responsibility. Uh, under Section 98 and under Standing Order 98, it is out of order. I call the honourable member for Casey. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Assistant Minister for the Infrastructure. Member for Casey has the call. Thank you, Madam the member Speaker. Member for Casey has the call. Remember My question is to the seat. Assistant Minister for resume Infrastructure and Regional Development. And I ask the Minister to Do update to the leave? House on action the government is taking to of deliver what? vital infrastructure Not if it's in meant Victoria to and to outline how this will create jobs and boost the economy. The member for Casey, I would refer the manager of opposition business to page, one, to page 189 of the practice, when he is obviously on his feet for those purposes. Madam now he'll resume his seat. Speaker, he'll resume his seat. And you know perfectly well if it's designed to disrupt, you may not. I won't argue with you. You resume your seat. And at the end of question time, we'll listen. On what? I said yes. Sir. I've asked you on what. You have the call for one moment. Okay. The point of order is on the fact that you ruled a question out of order without it being completed. You should hear the completion of the question. No Otherwise, how the can you say it? Sounds... The member for Casey will have has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Assistant Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. You resume your seat. Resume your seat. Resume your seat or leave. The member for Casey, the member for Casey, resume his seat. 
The member for Isaacs will desist. Uh, the member for Hunter, I said your question was out of order. You offered to rephrase it. I said it is out of order. Madam Speaker. I said the question was out of order. Madam Speaker, I take a point of order. You can have one moment. You yourself, Madam Speaker, have set the precedent. On a number of occasions, numerous occasions in this place, you have, have allowed members to rephrase their questions yes, I because have. you thought they bordered on not being compliant I, with the I standing order. I have allowed it for a variety of reasons, but being out of order in this way against standing order 98 is not one of them. I now, think the it would be helpful if you let me finish the, the question. Case he has the call. Well, I'll be back tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. Good. I look forward to it. No. No, you can't. You can't. You're out of order. You're out of order. I would ask the clerk, was it formally moved? Was it formally moved? Did he move it? Did he? Right. Uh, the clerk is of the opinion that it had been moved. So you may go ahead. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the chair's ruling be dissented from. Madam Speaker, what we've just seen in the ruling you have given is ruling a question out of order without allowing the question to be stated. It's as simple as that. What was given at the beginning of the question set the context for it, and at the end of the question, the, the Shadow Minister for Agriculture had just started, had just started, Madam Speaker, to ask about future action taken by the Prime Minister with respect to the Ministerial Code of Conduct. Something which must be allowed. Because make no mistake about the gravity of this. We have a ruling of a court reflecting on the behaviour of someone who is now a Minister of the Crown. This is a significant issue which we have a right to discuss within the parliament. And you cannot, Madam Speaker, simply because the preface to the question dealt with what happened to him prior to being a minister, rule that the latter part of the question is out of order when it deals exactly with what the Prime Minister is going to do now in counselling or not counselling giving a tick of approval or showing the disapproval that the Australian people feel and that a court now feels for the behaviour of the Minister for Agriculture. Madam Speaker, the contempt of the parliament is shown by the fact that the minister concerned himself can't even remain within the chamber while this is debated. The contempt for the parliament is shown, Madam Speaker, by the fact that you as Speaker would not even allow a question to be completed, knowing full well that had the question been completed, it was entirely within standing orders. Knowing full well, Madam Speaker, that you were not shutting down a question that was out of order, you were shutting down a debate within this parliament. You were shutting down, Madam Speaker, a discussion about whether or not, whether or not the behaviour in future of the Minister of the Crown can be consistent with what a judge has now reflected on. Whether the behaviour of the Minister of the Crown in future should be allowed to occur in a way that has been deeply reflected on by a court and goes directly to the benefit of someone who is a personal benefactor to that minister. This is a serious question to be asked within the parliament. And, Madam Speaker, the gravity of it I think you knew well when you decided to not allow the question to be completed. Because the only moment at which you could have said it was out of order would have been if the member for Hunter had completed at that moment. But he was continuing, and you knew, Madam Speaker, he was continuing, and so you stopped him there. You did not allow a rephrase, you did not allow a completion of the question in the full knowledge, Madam Speaker, that had there been a completion of the question, it was clearly within the standing orders. A lot of the Australian people, Madam Speaker, would like to know whether the Prime Minister thinks what the Minister for Agriculture did was okay. 
A lot of the Australian people, Madam Speaker, want to know whether this Prime Minister gives a tick to the future for his ministers to want to interfere in private litigation. Madam Speaker, the email that was concerned, the email that was concerned was no small matter. This was somebody who was senior not merely on the front bench of his party at the time, but then, as in now, seen as a potential future deputy prime minister when that side of the house is in office. And, Madam Speaker, in that context, in that context, it has to be allowed that this parliament is the place where he can be answerable. We know full well from the behaviour of the prime minister and by quickly they, how they scurried out the door that it will appear the ministerial code of conduct will do nothing to improve his behaviour in the future. It appears full well, Madam Speaker, that his own sense of what's right and wrong, given that he wrote the email when he did, shows that he thinks this sort of behaviour is OK. The one place where he needs to be answerable, Madam Speaker, is on the floor of this parliament. And your ruling, your ruling Madam Speaker, said that this parliament will allow the issue to be suppressed. Your ruling, Madam Speaker, said that this parliament will make no attempt to pull into line this Minister for Agriculture, that the Prime Minister can't even be asked whether or not that behaviour will be acceptable into the future. Madam Speaker, the way in which the benefactor concerned has provided assistance to the Minister for Agriculture is not limited to him. Gina Reinhardt flew three coalition MPs to Hyderabad in a private jet. It was not only, it was not only Madam Speaker, the Minister for Agriculture who was concerned here. It was also the Foreign Minister, Madam Speaker, the Foreign Minister not present here today, as well as the Minister for Agriculture, who has been a direct beneficiary of this individual. A direct beneficiary who a member of the front bench seen as a future Deputy Prime Minister when there's a coalition government, is willing to try to interfere in private litigation. Madam Speaker, be in no doubt, every time your rulings try to shut down debate in this parliament, the Australian people know to look more carefully. Every time there's an attempt by this government to cover up, the warning lights go off throughout the entire community. Madam Speaker, there is no way in the world, at its simplest under the standing orders, that this ruling can be justified. Because at its core, Madam Speaker, you ruled that a question was out of order when it had not been completed. You ruled, Madam Speaker, that a question which you could not possibly know the contents of because it hadn't been said out loud, but you knew it was out of order. Madam Speaker, that sort of ruling makes a joke of the parliament. That sort of ruling, Madam Speaker, makes a farce of this being question time. Be in no doubt, we've sort of given up on the concept that their answers will be relevant. We've sort of given up on the concept, after the ruling was made a while ago, that if we use fairness in the question, anything that relates to the word fair is somehow in. We know that that ruling's been made. But now to be at the point where you won't even allow a question to be stated. You won't even give them a chance to evade and to perform and to cavort and to play the little games that this mob over here play in question time, because you can't even bear to hear the full 30 seconds of an opposition statement. You can't even bear to allow a question to go for the full 30 seconds allowed. You can't even bear, Madam Speaker, for the question to set the context and then ask for the detail of what the Prime Minister will do now. Madam Speaker, it is essential if question time is going to remain some sort of question and answer session back forth that there will at least be questions that are not Dorothy Dix's. But over the last few weeks, Madam Speaker, more and more you are ruling questions from the opposition out of order. And today your ruling took it to an absolutely new level where the ruling was made before the question had been stated. Here, here. Madam Speaker, there is no way on earth you knew whether or not a question was out of order that you hadn't heard. There is no way on earth you knew. And the opposition handled it the correct way. We rose on points of order and asked, could the question be concluded so that you could then rule? 
The, the member for Hunter asked whether it could even be rephrased, notwithstanding that you'd ruled on something he hadn't even completed. The opposition has made every effort in question time today to not get to the point that we're at right now. But we're at the point we're at right now, Madam Speaker, because of the arrogance of this government and because of the way you have used your position in that chair to prevent questions from being asked. To prevent questions from being asked, Madam Speaker. This is an issue, this is an issue that goes to the heart of the character of people who sit opposite that goes to the heart of the character of the, Minister for, of the Minister for Agriculture and whether or not the Prime Minister not I agree whether he sanctions what was done in the past prior to him being a minister, if that's what was being asked, it would have been out of order. But you ruled before the question got to the part about it being about future conduct as a minister, which undoubtedly, undoubtedly, Madam Speaker, was within standing orders. Entirely within standing orders. And so in that context, Madam Speaker, we have no choice. We either accept a situation where this parliament becomes a joke. We either accept a situation where this parliament becomes a place where this government can cover up and be answerable to no one, or we move to set in a ruling that could not possibly have been accurate for one very simple reason, Madam Speaker. How can you rule a question out of order that you haven't heard? Yeah. Is the motion seconded? I call the honourable member for Hunter. It is, Madam Speaker. Motions of dissent in the Speaker's ruling are not motions to be taken lightly. And this opposition does not take them lightly. It's why dissent motions are so rare in this place, because oppositions use them guardingly. And whether, it doesn't matter whether we like the Speaker or dislike the Speaker. It doesn't matter whether the Speaker has a reputation for fairness or otherwise. Oppositions generally are reluctant to move dissent. But we had no choice today, Madam Speaker, clearly no choice. For a start, as the, leader of op the manager of opposition uh, business pointed out, you did not even let me complete my question, Madam Speaker. And if you had, you would have come to the conclusion, surely, despite the pressure from those who sit opposite, that the question was entirely in order. Now, there are a number of principles here. For a start, Madam Speaker, the, question, the opposition under the Westminster system has limited opportunity to hold the government to account, or more particularly, to hold government ministers to account. And question time is one of our few opportunities. And when you prevent us from exercising that Thank right, Madam Speaker, you not, under, un, not only undermine our cause, but you undermine the very nature of the Westminster system. And the question today, Madam Speaker, was a very serious one. It was one which picked up on the very serious re reflections of Justice Brett and of the High Court, who himself expressed grave concern about the actions of the, the now minister back in 2011. And if you had allowed me to complete my question, Madam Speaker, you would have found that I was most interested that the Prime Minister has by now reassured himself, felt confident that all the minister's actions between 2011 up until this date, including his 20 months or so as a minister, have been appropriate and within the standards of his own ministerial uh, code of conduct. That's what we would like to know, and I'm hoping that the Prime Minister is now reflecting on that question I've belatedly put, and he will come back to the House and give us a reassurance in some future time, hopefully sooner rather than later, that he has reassured himself that this minister has not operated outside his own ministerial code of conduct. Now, Madam Speaker, I said question time is a time to hold ministers to, to account, and this is a minister who certainly needs a lot of supervision and needs to be held to an account to account. This has been a chaotic minister. This has been an incompetent minister, Madam Speaker. This is a minister who is prepared to come into this place, provide an answer which is a total embellishment, total embellishment of the effectiveness of his drought policy, and then go back and change the hand side, entirely change the hand side to, to change what he said in this place. Then, of course, he denies, he denies ever knowing about the Hansard changes, Madam Speaker, until I raise them in this place. 
Well, we know that we know, thanks to the Senate estimates process, that that was not the case, Madam Speaker. Now, Madam Speaker, this is not the first time you've denied me an opportunity to ask the Minister for Agriculture a question. And on both occasions, I would put it to you, there was nothing extraordinary about those questions. They were questions which were entirely consistent with questions asked in this place on a daily basis, questions which you regularly allow to go through on the basis of the standing orders. There was nothing special here, Madam Speaker. A simple question to the Prime Minister. Is he confident that his minister has been compliant with the Code of Ministerial Code of Conduct? Remembering this is a minister who promised the agriculture sector a white paper by Christmas. We are now 20 months into the term of this government and we have not had any agriculture policy in this country. Policy inertia writ large. And yet, Madam Speaker, those on the other side don't want us to ask a question of the Minister for Agriculture because he, they know he is a person who is running a chaotic operation that has backflipped on all his pre-election promises, is constantly in the media for all the wrong reasons, and they know on that basis that this is a minister in need of protection. Well, I said to you before I sat down, Madam Speaker, we shall return. We will be back. There will be plenty more question times, and there is a limit to the extent that the Leader of the House can give you the nudge and the wink whenever he believes one of his ministers is in need of protection. This is not a protection racket, this place, Madam Speaker. This is the national parliament of this country, and we are entitled to ask question, ministers questions when we believe they have misled the Australian people or they have acted in a, in a way which is contrary to the Members national interest. time has elapsed. I call the Honourable the Leader of the House. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, what an extraordinary performance from the member for Watson. Uh, the member for Watson has obviously been taking acting lessons, Madam Speaker, over the summer break, because I think his uh, performance in this extraordinary debate today would make Laurence Olivier blush. Uh, it was so over the top. I think most people haven't seen a performance like that since Theda Barra in the silent movies, Madam Speaker. <laughs> I, mean, I was embarrassed, Madam Speaker, that the member for Watson could get himself so worked up about a matter that's so vitally important to the nation, so vitally important to the nation that it took until question 20 to be asked about on question time today, Madam Speaker. Listening to the member for Watson, you would think the most heinous crime in the history of Federation had been perpetrated by the Minister for Agriculture on the Australian policy, Madam Speaker. And yet it took until 3.05 p.m. in question time for the first question to be asked. Now, Madam Speaker, usually when the opposition wants to build up momentum, when they want to get to a crescendo, bring the House to boiling point that would require a dissent in the Speaker's ruling or a motion of censure against the Prime Minister of the Government, usually there's a bit of spade work that goes into it, Madam Speaker. It usually starts at about 2 o'clock. It starts about two o'clock, and then by about quarter to three, the manager of opposition business leader of the opposition are talking about whether now's the time. Do we do it now? Do we bring the trap shut right now, Madam Speaker, while we're still on television? Or do we wait and keep building the momentum for the great crescendo, the great performance, the magic trick, the smoke and mirrors that will bring the house down, Madam Speaker? That's what usually happens. <laughs> now, Madam Speaker, I know a bit about that because I've done that myself a bit over the years, no. uh, with a bit of success. No. And the member for Grindler, he's done it a bit over the years too. He, I, he was blushing with shame, Madam Speaker, dare I say it. <laughs> blushing with shame during the member for Watson's performance because he knows it was all very half-cocked, Madam Speaker. It all went off very half-cocked. And at five past three, the opposition rose to its feet to bring the Minister for Agriculture down. To bring the Minister for Agriculture down, Madam Speaker, to get his scalp, Madam Speaker. Now, sadly, the opposition is desperately floundering since the budget. That's what is absolutely apparent, Madam Speaker. The opposition has run up the white flag on the budget and are looking for any distraction that they can find. They have spent 18 months, Madam Speaker, basking, relaxing, lying on a banana lounge, sucking on a banana milkshake, thinking this is all very easy. We'll all be back in government. 
All these lovely front benches think they're all going to be ministers in 18 months, Madam Speaker. They've done none of the hard work necessary in opposition right. to convince the Australian public to change the government. They thought it was all going to be plain sailing. The member for Watson, of course, a great downhill snow skier, as we know, Madam Speaker, thought all he had to do was bend his knees, bend his knees, Madam Speaker, and he would get into government at the next election. Well, sadly for them, the budget has been very well received. The government is getting on with the job of doing what small business need and require to create jobs, of doing what families want in terms of childcare and support for them to get back into the workplace. The government is focusing on productivity and participation and population. The government has switched the agenda, Madam Speaker, to the things that the Australian public want to talk about. The Australian public want to know what the government's going to do about jobs, and they got the answer in the budget. They want to know what we're going to do about productivity, and they got the answer in the budget. They know that we're bringing fairness into the workplace through the changes to the paid parental leave scheme, Madam Speaker. They know that we want to reduce the tax burden. We want to cut spending. We want to achieve savings and, by this way, make the country prosper and the economy grow. But when they look on the other side of the House, Madam Speaker, the they see a blank page. They see the future is now. They say, we are us. They say, them are you, or whatever the latest expression is. They say, I don't know what she said, but I agree with it anyway, Madam Speaker. They say, it doesn't matter where you start as long as you get somewhere in the end, Madam Speaker. The member for Jager Jager says that the money has to be paid for by somewhere. Somewhere's got to pay for it. They've got to find the money somewhere, Madam Speaker. The problem is the Australian taxpayer are looking at the opposition and saying, what would they do if they were elected? And what they know is that they would increase spending. They would cut the savings of the government. They would increase spending by $16 billion in foreign aid alone, Madam Speaker. They know that they would increase taxes. They would bring back a they would introduce a super tax of 15 per cent on self-funded retirees. They know that the opposition is utterly unreconstructed since the chaos and circus-like atmosphere of the Rudd Gillard Rudd government, Madam Speaker. So, what they're doing instead, led by this very weak leader of the opposition, led by the weak leader of the opposition, they're looking for distractions. Now, the distraction, Madam Speaker, I think, quite wrongly, has been marriage equality, Madam Speaker. I think it's very wrong on an issue that is extremely important to a lot of Australians and extremely important to members in this House to be handled deftly and carefully and successfully. Instead, oh, the Leader of the Opposition is playing this. politics with marriage equality as a distraction from the budget. And he must be surprised, Madam Speaker, surprised that the Greens don't support his push, that the marriage equality lobby has been lukewarm in their support for the uh, Leader of the Opposition's bill, that the opposition or the government hasn't rushed to support it. Because that was supposed to distract people from the budget, Madam Speaker, marriage equality. The next thing to distract people from the budget was to not keep up with the bipartisan position on national security. Most appallingly, Madam Speaker, the government has put on the agenda taking away the citizenship of dual citizens as our latest measure to protect Australians, to protect Australians from the threat of terrorism. And yet the Opposition is playing politics, Madam Speaker, with national security in order to try and distract people from the budget. The uh, minister resume his seat. The member for Perth on the point of order. Absolute, Madam Speaker, absolutely zero relevance on the part the of, the, uh, of the. The member will resume her seat. The minister has the call. The member for Hunter. Now, Madam Speaker, as the member for Perth would know, a dissent motion in the Speaker is a very wide-ranging debate, <laughs> and uh, I'm taking the opportunity to be wide-ranging, Madam Speaker, because the sadness, the sadness for the opposition is that national security was supposed to be the distraction, and now they've fallen upon this as the distraction. If things that the 
Minister for Agriculture is accused of doing well before he was a Minister of the Crown, Madam Speaker, in a private capacity. The opposition's waited until five past three today to move to ask a question and now move a motion of dissent in the Speaker. The reality is the opposition is now trying to find a new weapon of mass destruction, distraction from the budget. This government has absolute confidence in the Minister for Agriculture. The Minister for Agriculture is doing an outstanding job. He's recovered the live cattle trade. He's increasing the agricultural exports from this country. Agricultural prices are increasing. States like mine in South Australia are benefiting from increased sheep uh, meat prices, increased wheat prices. The Minister for Agriculture is doing a fantastic job. He and the Minister for Industry are reforming country of origin labelling laws in this country. He is not overreacting to television reports uh, and closing down whole industries. He's building the country, Madam Speaker, and the Prime Minister and the government have absolute confidence in the member for New England to continue as the Minister for Agriculture, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it's quite possible this is the worst opposition ever in Australia's history. It's quite likely that the Leader of the Opposition is the weakest and laziest Leader of the Opposition in Australia's history. The reality is, Madam Speaker, they would have been better off having a proper, drawn-out brawl for the Labor leadership and fought over what they believed in, rather than all forming a circle after the trauma of the Rudd Gillard Rudd years and saying, let's all pretend there are no dysfunctional elements of our party. They haven't cleansed themselves. The public know it, Madam Speaker. And on that note, I move that the motion be put. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. I declare the motion carried. We will now put the question of dissent. All those in favour of the motion of dissent being carried, say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. So we have been around for a cup of tea, I think, Madam Speaker. Yeah, better be all around for a cup of tea. Right, we now move to uh, presentation of papers. I call the. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> We're having a division. You think it was a change of government? <laughs> I thought you'd just given up. A few more branches to go to again.
lock the doors. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. And I appoint as tellers for the eyes the members for Lawler and Shortland, and as tellers for the eyes the members for Bass and the member for Parks. The result of the division is eyes 49, nose 80. The question is therefore negative. <laughs> I call the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, I move that further questions be placed on the notice paper.